wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, uh, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. As if you've never heard that before, that's always on the show. Why is that? I don't know why. It's something we started like a million years ago. And then when I stopped doing it, people said, why the hell do you sing that part? We love it. Quit. Uh, uh, stop not doing it. And uh, we continue ever since. And then you run up to me at shows and go, the Chris Voss Show. And I go, scaredy. Anyway, guys, welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here because we love you. We love you from the deepest bottom parts of our heart. You know, we love you so much, we don't even charge for the show. And I bring this up as a matter of shaming and guilt, of course, to get the plugs in. Sam Harris, I was listening to his show, brilliant mind. Uh, he charges for his show. And I was listening to one going, God damn, I got to pay $8 to listen to the show a month? What the hell? So you know what we do out of the goodness and kindness of our hearts? Because we love you so much. This is the depth of our love that I'm trying to convey here. We don't charge anything. And it's free. But one thing we would like to ask you for, because there always has to be a catch, please refer to the show your family, friends, and relatives. Tell them to go to youtube.com, forward slash Chris Voss, goodreads.com, forward slash Chris Voss. LinkedIn, the big LinkedIn newsletter over there. I think it's crazy. The big 130,000 group on LinkedIn. Go check out all those places. Refer your friends to them. Give us five star reviews on iTunes. And you know what? For all the depth of love that we have for you, we will love you even more, as if that were possible, but I'm not sure. But we're going to spin it that way. Thanks, Manus, for always tuning in, as always. We appreciate you. We have an amazing author on the show today. He's going to be talking to us about his amazing book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John Perkins is on the show with us today, and he's got his third edition out of his amazing book uh, in New York Times bestseller, all updated and expanded with 12 explosive new chapters. And uh, we're going to be talking to him about what goes into his book and everything else. But let me tell you, this guy isn't just some author of a book, eh? He's uh, the chief economic E economist at a major consulting firm. He served as an advisor to the World Bank, the UN, the IMF, Fortune 500 corporations, leaders of countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, and plus U.S. government agencies. That too. He's written 11 books that have been published in over 35 languages. His groundbreaking Confessions of an Economic Hit Man spent 72 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and has sold more than 2 million copies. And now he's got the third edition of it out. We're going to get a chance to talk to him. What do you know? He's here today. He just showed up on the show. He's like, hey, you want to talk about my book? And we're like, damn it, yes, let's do it. Welcome to the show, John. How are you? Thanks, Chris. It's it's great to be with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you're always, it's, always, it's, always, it's always worth a good laugh. It's always a great way to start off the show. Be very, very there you laugh. go. We call it infotainment around here. We inform ah. people and make them smile, and therefore they learn better. Or not at all. One of the two. I haven't figured it out yet, but uh, it seems to work for us. Whatever. It's very Shakespearean, you know, uh, yeah. rap, rap tragedy and laughs. That's true. I mean, we try not to kill anybody on the show, but there's still time. Uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want to make it you, John, that's for sure. Uh, maybe myself. Uh, I'll probably die from this eventually. Uh, give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs. It's, it's a .org. Oh, a oh, .org. Well, that .org. Those yeah. Two. I'm that's very cool. organic. You know, it's John Perkins .org. It's my Judges, name. can we accept a .org? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm so glad to hear it, you know. Yeah. Give that to me once again because I think I interrupted no. you mid-org. John Perkins .org org there we go john perkins.org there you go guys go uh so john you've uh basically this when was this book originally published well they so it's really a trilogy uh, you know mm -hmm. the, the first the first one was published in 2004 the mm -hmm. second one in 2016 a lot happened between 2004 and 2016 really? in the economic hitman <laughs> realm and in many other realms right yeah. And now a lot more has happened since 2016. So we've got this third edition, which the subtitle is China's Economic Hitman Strategy 
and how to take the global takeover, how to stop the, sorry, ways to stop the global takeover. China. China is, is, is there something bad about China? <laughs> we'll get into it. So uh, you originally called the book, and it still is called that, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Uh, give us a, get some history or background beyond the, the reasoning of that title. Well, d during my time as an economic hitman, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, I was chief economist at a major consulting firm. I had a staff of up to 50 people. And, and our job, my job really was to go out and, and identify countries that had resources U.S. corporations wanted, like oil, uh, and then arrange huge loans to that country from the World Bank or its sister organizations. The money, however, never actually went to the country. It came back to big engineering firms in the United States, Halliburton, Brown and Root, Bechtel, Stone and Webster, companies like that, or maybe General Electric, some of the, the equipment suppliers, mm -hmm. uh, to build big infrastructure projects in these countries. Uh, things like uh, power plants and industrial parks, highways, ports, uh, uh, things that would benefit a few wealthy families, the, oh. ones, the ones that own the businesses and the industries, and of oh. course, made huge profits for our corporations. But uh, in the long run, the people suffered because money was diverted from health, education, and other social services to pay off the interest on the loan. And in the end, the principal couldn't be repaid. That wow. was part of the strategy. Wow. You know? And that was so, actually a strategy to never get the principal paid or yeah yeah, yeah usually these countries we knew ahead of time that we were going to give them two bigger loans that they weren't going to be able to repay the strategy so and we implemented what was called neoliberal economics and that means we went back in usually as the guy in the guise of the international monetary fund and restructured the loan for the country you know kind of deal with them but that deal uh insisted that they sell their resource, their oil, or today it would be lithium, cobalt, the things that are used in a green economy. Mm -hmm. They sell these real cheaply to our corporations without many, if any, environmental and social restrictions. Wow. But they privatize, you know, privatize their, their government owned or the publicly owned sectors like the utility companies, water and sewage systems, electric companies, sell them to our investors. Mm -hmm. uh, drop regulations you know basically trickle down economics it's it's known as neoliberal neoliberal economics so we insisted on these things and then our corporations our oil companies our mining companies could go in and very much exploit the resources the country the company the country had you mean we weren't spreading democracy isn't that interesting you know that <laughs> like, like all historical empires uh we have a you know we, we sell a good story and that is that we're spreading democracy of course you know under pinochet chile that was not a democracy it was a terrible dictatorship we've seen yeah. it in saudi arabia we see it in egypt today we see you know no what we do is 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 spread american corporative corporate corporativism you know big corporations what we call the corporatocracy the people who run our big corporations also have tremendous influence in government. And basically, this whole empire is a corporate empire supported by the U.S. government and these these banking interests that are that are controlled by the U.S. government, like the World Bank and, and, and the U.S. Treasury Department and USAID and many of the other institutions. These are known as the Washington Consensus. So you get the Washington Consensus putting money into these countries and then they the neoliberal economics comes along to make sure that the money comes back to us in many different forms. It sounds like we're spreading uh, capitalism or unbridled capitalism uh, as opposed to democracy. Well, it's a form of capitalism that I, I call predatory capitalism. Because, ah. Yeah. You know, real, real capitalism, it's, it says, well, the government doesn't own the means of production or business. That's one of the definitions, but also included in that definition is, is a healthy respect for, for competition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, these systems destroy competition for the most part. You know, it's our big businesses that take over and the small businesses in these countries where we work really don't, don't have, have a chance unless, they, unless they're helping us, our corporations out in one way or another. And it's really very, very exploitative. So. Uh, and it is true that the government doesn't own the means of production or business in the United States, but those who own the means of 
production and the businesses really, in a way, own the government to a very large degree, as I think we all know at this point. Yeah, and especially with like Citizens United and other things that SCOTUS has done in recent ruling over the last 10, 20 years. I mean, it just seems to have amplified how much uh, top people at capitalism and kind of, kind of almost an oligarchy system. Do you think that we're an oligarchy? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in a certain to a certain degree, we're an oligarchy and maybe not to the same extent that a country like Russia is today. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we are a corporatocracy is the way I would put it, where you oh. really where you really get these, uh, you know, the, the people who run our big corporations and often, you know, somebody who works for is high up in an executive in an oil company ends up going to con going going to into the government for a few years uh and runs one of the businesses that's supposed to be regulating the oil companies knowing full well that he or she is going to go back to the oil companies like condoleezza rice secretary of state was is a great example of that and, the, and there's many many well the bush family itself <laughs> bush yeah. family halberton the, <laughs> yeah. the yeah. cheney, Dick cheney. It, you know, we just had uh, a few days ago Stephen Simon on, uh, who uh, you know he did some stuff with uh, uh, the usual uh, people you're probably aware of. You know, uh, um, I'm I'm trying to put something together, but you know, worked State Department different things. He wrote the book Grand Illusion: The Rise and Fall of American Ambition in the Middle East, and uh, basically profiled the 40 years of presidencies and and you know what they try to do and we'll fix it. You know sometimes made it worse um and so it was interesting to me in fact you mentioned Condoleezza rice i was just earlier about an hour ago watching john stewart's interview with her and hillary clinton and you know it was all the usual and i, I i'm not being i'm not trying to be glib about this but it was the usual you know the the democracy the democracy and spreading the beautiful shining city on the hill sort of image of what we were trying to do in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all these different places. But, uh, you know, it, I, it, it's interesting how we try and use that sleight of hand to do what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the joke that everyone talks about that really isn't a joke, it's true. The truism is, you know, uh, what, what, you need help in your country? Uh, do you have oil? <laughs> yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, you want to trade it in dollars? You know, there's a lot of argument about that going on right now. Uh, so let's step, let's dive into the core of your book. Give us like a 30,000 feet of of what you initially wrote. And then let's talk about some of the new additions and chapters and why those were important to add. Well, you know, I think the 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 initial book was about what I described. And, and there's another layer here. That's the people we call jackals. And these are if if a, if a country's president or minister of finance whoever we're dealing with doesn't buy into our deals doesn't play the game with us uh, they know that, that these jackals will come in these are people who usually are cia assets or maybe they're one of the other organizations assets but they overthrow governments and mm -hmm. sometimes assassinate leaders and you know unfortunately the United States has a long history of this. We mentioned Pinochet of Chile. Well, you know, he came in after Allende was taken out in a, in a CIA-supported coup that Henry Kissinger has admitted to. And we've admitted to doing such things in, in with Mossadegh and Iran and the Mongol and the Congo. Yeah, yeah, over mm -hmm. and over. So it made my job pretty easy. You know, I'd go into <laughs> to these presidents and say, hey, you know, here in this end, I got a few million, a few billion dollars uh, that it's going to benefit your family, you know, and, and on the other hand, if you don't play this deal in this hand, I've got hmm, a gun and, you know, I never carried a gun, <laughs> but I knew that people but, you know, me with guns and, the implication, and so, yeah. so did these presidents and, the, yeah. you know, a couple of my clients that didn't buy into these deals was the democratically elected president of Ecuador, speaking of democracy, Jaime Roldos, who pissed off the oil companies, who pissed off American business mm -hmm. and was taken out basically. I mean, he died in a, in an airplane crash that's never been proven that it was an assassination, but there's a lot of evidence that points that way. It's, you know, if you want to kill somebody, the, an airplane crash is a great way to do it because the smoking gun goes down with the plane. Yeah. I'm laughing about this, but it was tragic. And shortly after him, uh, Omar Torrijos, head of state of Panama, who had negotiated the Panama Canal Treaty with Jimmy Carter and was standing up to the United States in many ways, he, he met the same fate. His private plane went down in almost the same conditions as, as Jaime Roldos's. These guys didn't play the game. But most of the clients I worked with in, in, in Colombia and Argentina and Guatemala and, and uh, Indonesia and, 
and in many other countries, uh, you know, played the game, and and they benefited, their families benefited, and our corporations benefited. And I yeah. benefited. <laughs> there's almost like a there's almost like a mafia element to of, of it where we show up in a country and go, yeah, hey, it's a nice country you got here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it, but uh, we got a deal for you. Exactly. 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 So the original book goes into that kind of stuff and a lot of examples. And the second book that came out in 2016, the second in the in the in the trilogy, uh, looks at this new wave of economic hitmen that came along. And basically at that point, every major international corporation they had gone global. The globalization had occurred after 2004 mm -hmm. and uh, on a big scale. And every major corporation has its equivalent of economic hitmen. They have their own. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're like a corporation will, will say, I'm, we need to build a new industrial plant, a big multi-billion dollar facility. And they, and their economic hitmen go to Indonesia and they go to Philippines and they go to Malaysia and they, they compete, you know, and they say, hey, we'll build a plant here and hire a lot of people if you will reduce your taxes on us or not make, make us pay any taxes or meet any environmental regulations uh, wow. and, and uh, you know maybe lower your, your wage rates a little bit or the conditions around so there's this incredible competition uh wow. so every major corporation and that's just one example of how, how these economic hitmen work the second book the new confessions of an economic hitman is is about that and now this third book is what's happened <laughs> in the time since then which is china's economic hitmen have really really learned from our successes mm -hmm. and our failures and they've outmaneuvered us uh, their economic hitmen are more efficient than ours are all around the world today so they have become the number one investor and mm -hmm. the number one trading partner on every continent there you go i mean i've seen a lot of that in we've seen a lot of that in africa uh you know sometimes they've even repossessed ports uh russia's been called in to kind of be the gun enforcer in some of these countries and uh the precious metals you know there's this fight over this precious metals and what develops to do these things it, it's really interesting it's almost like a game of who can exploit who first and best at yeah. this point yeah you know i got a i just happen to have here a, a print of a pretty interesting map mm -hmm. um so the red shows where china is the number one trading partner and the blue is the united states Mm -hmm. And you can see our reach doesn't go nearly as far as theirs. Uh, yeah. Down below, it points out that 100 and I think it's, a, let me see, 100 and, uh, 124 countries are in the, in the top, try to, to, is, are with China and 56 are with the United States. Did I get that right? 124, 50, I got it right. There yeah. you go. So, you know, the, China's reach has just been phenomenal. And this has all happened in, in, in less than a decade. It's been yeah. Truly amazing what China has done. And I have to say, Chris, part of it is because the United States devoted so many resources to Afghanistan and Iraq. And really, we neglected Latin America and Africa and parts of Asia. And, and, and uh, China moved in. Yeah. And, and today, it's something similar is happening where we're, we're de devoting tremendous amounts of resources to Ukraine. And um, China's moving into to the parts of the world that we're kind of leaving behind. It's it's why uh, the U.S. Vice President uh, recently spent quite a lot of time in Africa because she was trying to overcome uh, this tremendous momentum that China has built up on that continent, and partly as a result of the fact that we neglected we neglected Africa for many years. Was there? Any sort of racial bias as to why we neglected Africa? I know they went through a huge AIDS crisis that wiped out, I think, a quarter of the population and really stunted the future growth of that continent. Well, it's interesting that I think the average uh, age, not life expectancy, but average age in Africa is about 19 years old. Yeah. And in the United States and and, and in China and Russia, and it's it's something close to 40 40 years old yeah. you know it's it's well over it's 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 twice what it is in africa so yeah very young population the race issue is a fascinating one mm -hmm. um in december there was a meeting a global security meeting uh, held in munich in, in germany and the global south it was fascinating to see how the what we call the global south uh africa latin america you know the the places that they had this very, very 
different understanding of mm -hmm. the, the war in Ukraine than what we get and what most of uh, much of Europe gets. And, and they actually said they felt that the war in Ukraine was a white person, European American war. Wow. And to them, they, they, you know, and I'm not, I'm not defending this. I'm simply pointing out what came out of those meetings that they said, you know, you're putting a lot more resources into Ukraine than you ever did to help us fight COVID. We've got starvation. We've got terrible malnutrition. We've got lousy health conditions. We need help. Uh, mm -hmm. We we need people to invest in our economy, mm -hmm. and you haven't done that. Mm -hmm. And and you know, Europe has accepted tremendous amounts of migrants from or immigrants from. Uh, uh, from Ukraine and, and not done the same with people from Africa. So there's this, there is this, you, you raised issue and you, know, mm -hmm. you raised the race issue. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not defending in any of these particular aspects, but you get a very, very different view when you talk to people in Africa and Latin America. I just came back from Latin America. I was there most of January and some of February and I speak Spanish fluently. I, you know, and talking to people, it's, they have such a different view of the world than we do. And to them, the, world, the biggest problems in the world are, are malnutrition, climate change, and what that's doing to their economies, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're saying, gee, just stop fighting, you guys. Stop all this competition in the North <laughs> and, the, and the insanity in the North and, and, and deal with what's really important in the long term to the long term survival of our species. Yeah, it, it's definitely something to contemplate. And, uh, you know, we as a, as America have a 400 year history with issues with race and, and, uh, everything else that's gone on with us. So, you know, there is some of that in play. I think some of the administrations that we've had, you can kind of look at and go, there might've been some preference there. Um, so in your book, do you talk about, you know, there's been some recent, uh, interesting moves that the Biden administration has done, the, the chip thing where they cut off the chips to China. Uh, and it seems like there's been a real push to move to manufacturing. There was uh, 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 Pelosi, uh, House Speaker Pelosi going to Taiwan, which has really pissed off the the China uh, folks. Um, do, you, do you get into some of that? Yeah, I do, very much so, you know, and, and I think to cut to the chase, I, the conclusion and perhaps the most important theme throughout the book is that uh, this economic hitman strategy, whether it's been implement, whether it is being implemented by the United States or China or anyone else, is is it's basically a competition that's a race to the to the to disaster. Uh, you know, it's, it's like nuclear war between USSR and Russia back in the day. Yeah, well, and it's you know it's but <clears throat> well, there's no question that that our current economic system. Uh, has created what we can call a death economy. It's an economic system that's that's consuming and polluting itself into extinction. Mm -hmm. In the short term, it's in, in the, and in the name of short term profits, it's depleting the resources it needs for the long term. Mm -hmm. and this is true whether it's being done for China or the United States or whom, whomever. It is a self uh, ultimately a self defeating uh, strategy. Hmm. And, and we need to understand that we in China can disagree on an awful lot of things. Uh, but let's agree that nobody wins this race. Nobody's a winner on a dead planet. So it's terribly important that we stop this competitive strategy for, 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 go, go, for exploitative domination of the world and turn this death economy into a life economy. And, yeah. and a life economy... Chris is an economic system that will pay people to clean up pollution, you know, to come up with ways to mine all the plastic that's in the oceans and recycle it as one example, and to regenerate uh, uh, coral reefs and, and other devastated environments, rainforests forests everywhere, uh, recycle, create new technologies like solar and wind and, and things that we haven't even thought of or, or we haven't pursued yet that don't ravage the earth mm -hmm. uh, you know to, to move from this death economy to a life economy doesn't mean that we're going to we're going to have to give up on good lives at all it means quite the opposite but it does mean that we will pay people to do things that 
not only make some short-term profits because business needs short-term profits. We all know mm -hmm. that you've got to, but, but not, but not these excessive short-term profits instead devote a great deal of that effort to the long-term survival of, of, of human beings on this planet and, and all life forms for that matter. So that the, the future success stories will be those that have worked toward creating a, a life economy. There you go. Uh, do you talk in the book about, you know, the interesting thing about China in recent strategy, you know, you, you, we've seen everything that you talk about in your book. I don't know if you touch on the islands they build, the man-made islands they build in the Pacific American uh, oceans. Uh, but uh, the one thing that's interesting is how bad the, uh, the one-child uh, policy has really seemed to cripple them and their future. Um, and, and may end up putting them in a situation of like Japan is going through right now. Well, Japan is still the, the third largest economy, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, while and then, and by a long, long distance. So China and the United States together produce about 45% of the world's economy, the GDP mm -hmm. and, 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 and Japan is way down about 7%. So it's, it's much lower. But I think, you know, we we tend I, there's a lot of people in the United States who want to want us to be convinced that China's in decline. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. And I see it as new generation of Chinese students. And I, I taught in an MBA program in Shanghai, a Chinese MBA program. where I had some incredible Chinese students. You know, I, I see them moving in a very different direction. They they don't want pollution. They've lived with horrible pollution. They say, you know, you in the United States, your kids don't have any idea what pollution is. We do, and we don't want it for our, our, for future generations. Uh, they don't see their slowdown in economic growth quite the same as we do, because their slowdown means that they're m more approaching something that was normal for the most mm. of the rest of the world. While they were going at 10% a year for 30 years, the rest of us were growing, you know, much, much less than that. And that's kind of what they're doing now. So they've they've come out of this huge growth period that they needed to bring them out of the cultural revolution out of the out of the tragedy that mao created until mm -hmm. he died in the mid 70s and they pulled themselves out of that with a huge effort and now they're kind of balancing off that normality so i don't mm -hmm. i don't see their their slowdown in in, in economic growth mm -hmm. to a level that's more consistent with the rest of the world is necessarily being a, a sign of a deterioration or decline that's interesting. I wondered about that because I guess there's, I, I don't know what the number is, but there's a incredible amount of uh, men in America or men in China who can't wife up, who can't family up. And, and certainly if you're not generationally growing as a country, as a people, you know, that was one of the things that made us a superpower, um, you know, having that marketplace and having the, that population growth. Um, you know, Japan is projected to be in a declining society of generational growth. And there's questions of the impact of, of how well it can support itself in the future. And, and some people speculate China's that same way. Well, there's a huge difference because China has really reached out to Africa and Latin America as, as markets and, and as places to supply them with their resources. And I said, you know, they recognize that the population of Africa is extremely young. Mm -hmm. And and they're drawing on that. They 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 that's an asset for them. They see that as an asset. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they have really reached out to the world. Japan certainly did that too with its many of its manufacturing goods, its cars that they sold around the world. But China's exceeding all of that. China's doing a, a a much better job than than Japan ever did in that regard. And let's not forget that you know China's declining population is declining from you know, over a billion people, almost a billion and a half people. Uh, we've still only, we've still got less than 400 million in the United States. So uh, they've still got a huge, huge population. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, so let me ask you this. Uh, there's been ch talk about, and I, I think it's more than talk, people have talked about how moving manufacturing from China to Mexico, which proximity-wise, um, gives us an interesting uh, trading route. I don't know why someone didn't think about it sooner, but uh, do you see this as a viable solution? I mean, Vietnam has risen as a replacement to China and other things. 
Well, China is moving increasingly, and in its its policy is to move away from kind of the cheap goods that it was famous for, very much like Japan did back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, mm. uh, so, and and into much higher tech goods. So, um, I think it does make a lot of sense for companies to to move to Mexico and, and other places, and. Um, I, and I, I was just recently in took, took a group of people to Guatemala. I, I, every year I take people to study to get to know the Mayan people, and there's some amazing stuff there. You can you can check it out on my website, johnperkins.org, and I invite all your listeners to join me on the next trip. And one of the, a man on this trip was a, a senior vice president at, at HP, formerly Hewlett Packard, uh, and uh, his company incidentally was r- ranked by Newsweek. Uh, I think it was last year, or the year before, as the, the most as the greenest company in the United States. And they're very, very determined to do this. And yeah, they're looking at moving their facilities to places like Mexico and, and, and other places. I think a lot of companies are doing that. If I were a CEO of a company, I would certainly be looking at diversifying uh, uh, around countries. But it's pretty hard to rule out China these days because uh, you know it's such a huge market for one thing. And it's kind of very... You know, it's got some very highly educated, well-trained people that's, that are staying in China. There's some leaving, but there's a lot staying. So, um, you know, this the idea of seeing China as an enemy, I think, is a huge mistake. And while I think it's good for companies to diversify where they locate their, their plant and the markets they reach, uh, let's not try to segregate this between the United States and China, like the Cold War you mentioned earlier, we don't want to repeat that. It doesn't make any sense to repeat that. The world is too small. We're too deeply integrated now uh, to repeat that that tragic mistake. There you go. And so you think we're in the third wave of this economic hitman, the EHM, as you refer to it. And uh, it, are things getting better or are they getting worse from the three different waves that we've processed through? Uh, well, it depends on <laughs> Depends on which. Like, well, it, so it's getting better for China, mm-hmm. worse for the United States, and and worse for the world. Mm. As as I said before, this uh, you know this competition, the economic uh, an economic hitman strategy, and basically the whole thing is run by what you could define as an economic hitman strategy. I go into detail in the book the, about the four pillars of the economic hitman strategy, which which basically define the economy and economic growth, and the way these were being applied by both countries and and others is is taking us into terrible climate change and mm-hmm. uh, you know the threat of nuclear war and uh, terrible environmental devastation and income inequality mm-hmm. uh, so you know in the long run this is not beneficial to anyone in the short mm-hmm. run we can talk about whether china is doing better the united states is doing better but when we define better as increasing what we call gross domestic product or gross global product in this case, it's a misnomer and it's it's very misleading because those statistics measure how well the wealthiest people are doing. They don't really measure overall prosperity. And I'll give you an example. And this is one of the reasons that I, I was an economic hitman for 10 years and I believed in what I was doing. I thought that that model I was using, that economic hitman strategy was helping poor countries. Mm-hmm. Because statistically, we'd show that when you invest in a lot of money in infrastructure, the economy grows. Mm-hmm. And it does when you measure it by GDP. But that doesn't mean everybody's benefiting. It, it only yeah. Only means in most cases that a few people are benefiting. So here's an example. In the United States, we have three individuals, three, who own as much wealth as more than half the country. Mm-hmm. If those three individuals last year made 10% return on their wealth, and half the country lost 3%, lost 3%, wow. and the rest of the country remained the same, we'd show an overall growth of something close to 4%. Wow. It would look as though the entire country benefited, but in fact, only three individuals and their families <laughs> wow. benefited, and everybody else either lost or stayed the same. And if that's true in a country like the United States, where three individuals have as much wealth as half the country, what about in a country where three individuals or two individuals or families have as much wealth as 90% of the country? Yeah. And if you take the, the, the world as a whole, you know, you've got a handful of people 
uh, less than 100 who have tremendous amount of wealth. Mm -hmm. So global, the way we measure our, our global economy is totally biased in favor of the rich and big corporations. So we've got to stop that measurement and start measuring what it really means to have prosperity for everyone. Yeah. I mean, we've been watching the, the deconstruction of the middle class since the Reagan era times. Maybe you can say some of it came from uh, either Carter or Nixon, but definitely it seemed to have accelerated. You know, the trickle-down economics, I'm still waiting for my check uh, from Ronald Reagan. Uh, and, yeah, we, we've seen this. We've seen this huge rise of, of, uh, of ultra-rich people. Even over COVID, they got richer, you know. And the, it seems like the pan-globalism of these uh, quote unquote art oligarchs, I'll throw around the term for fun. Um, you know, it's, it, they're making more money globally as opposed to some of us locally. But yeah, there's, you know, you mentioned earlier the the Iraq and Afghanistan war and some of the different things that we're focused on. You know, I, I hear people say it even today, like we're spending all this money in Ukraine, like, uh, hey, uh, you know, we can't fund schools, we can't fund, you know, we got infrastructure falling apart in this country. A lot of stuff does seem to have been ignored here for a long time. I'm still waiting for the Trump inf infrastructure week to come through. Is that, I think that's any day now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. And while uh, the, the brutality that Russia's exhibited toward Ukraine is outrageous and mm -hmm. we have, it has to be stopped, uh, we've got to be careful that that war doesn't, doesn't drain us all of, of our resources and also it's a huge diversion from the, the, this long-term real problem of climate change that we're facing and the death economy in, in the world that's causing huge crises that are that are you know my 14 year old grandson and all his brothers and sisters around the planet are, are going to inherit uh, we've got to confront that definitely i mean we're seeing that with uh, rising sea level tides and you know, higher craziness in uh, uh, weather patterns and different things. You know, you, you you mentioned a really good point. I mean, I, I didn't realize how important Ukraine was to the global environment when it came to like sunflower seeds or wheat or uh, other different things. I was like, wait, they're Fertilizer. Being yeah. yeah. And, and so, yeah, I can see fighting over it, but it's almost like China has really benefited from our, like you say, a hyper focus on, uh, we need to be the policeman of the world and democracy. And, you know, we focused all this time in Afghanistan, Iraq and resources. And then, you know, we were even guilty of doing what you called the hitman theory there, where, you know, we were pouring money in that country and really just the guys who were running it were getting rich and embezzling money and sending to Swiss banks and different things like that nature. Um, well, how do we, how do we dial this back? How do we get on a, on a corrective thing? You know, you mentioned your website that all of us are, it's important to all of us to, uh, to, uh, try and correct this. How do we, how do we do that? How do we, each of us have that role to play? You know, I think Chris, it's, it's, that is the most important point of the book is to say that we, we must transform the death economy to a life economy. And every one of us has a role to play. Uh, you know, we, have, we, we, we are all consumers, mm -hmm. so we're victims of this economy, but we're also collaborators in the way we mm. consume. Many of us are investors or managers or owners or in, in these companies, and we have a lot more power than we realize. You know, I've had a number of chief executive offices of major corporations, people I know who said to me, I want my company to be greener. But I, I have grandchildren, you know? and but I know that if I lose uh, market share, uh, my main investors will fire me and replace me with someone who only cares about market share. So they beg me. They say, "Hey, tell your audience," and I'm telling this audience right now: uh, write any, write emails, Twitter, whatever it is, the, the way you communicate. Pick pick a company, uh, mm -hmm. or join a, 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 a consumer campaign, or, and and uh, pick pick a company. Uh, that you want to see change and write them a letter and say, hey, you know, I love your product, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to buy it anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia a fair salary mm -hmm. or living wage or clean up the pollution you've caused or whatever the issue is. And, and, when, and, and when, I, when you do change your policies, I'm going to make sure that hundreds of thousands of people know this. And you send that, that email uh, to 
all your social networking circles and you ask them to send it to all of theirs and to send it to these executives. And I've had executives plead with me to try to encourage people to do that because they say, you know, I, I don't read all these emails, but somebody looks them over and I get a matrix once a month that tells me and if I have all these emails insisting that we change, I can take those to our primary investors and it has a lot of power. Does the, you know, the Gen Z generation seems to be bringing like a lot of quote unquote wokeism to stuff. And it seems to be like, uh, you know, there's discussions about, I, don't, I never know if it's true or not, but you know, there's a lot of discussions among corporate uh, stuff that, that, okay, this new generation, they kind of want these, you know, more environmental friendly, more, you know, racial tolerance and, and inclusion, you know, more, you know, more of whatever the hell Bernie says. Uh, <laughs> um, does, does, I mean, is that having an effect? Is that weighing on the scale at all? Well, absolutely. And perhaps yeah. more in much of the rest of the world than it is in the United States. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, I think that we, we haven't experienced terrible pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, we have never, we have not had enemies on our border in anybody's lifetime. Yeah. Uh, you know, where most of the rest of the world has, yeah. uh, we're, we've got Canada and Mexico and the Atlantic and Pacific oceans. Right? And, mm -hmm. uh, um, so and there's we, sharks in them too. So <laughs> yeah, to get to they're, they're to us. sharks, but or, and plastic too. You got to, yeah, I think the plastic is more, more dangerous. I think most of the sharks yeah. are on the land. Yeah. Actually, yeah. the sharks are the sharks are on Wall Street. They, they, they hang out. And they've made they've 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 crept up. The, you know, they uh, yeah. in the ocean on, into Wall Street. But um, so you know, as I travel in places around the world, and and I'm speaking, I'm going to be speaking in three or four different places in Europe this summer, including a, a huge rock festival. Uh, Fifty-five thousand people. This is my third year there. I didn't know. You know, it was a break during the pandemic but before that and and now i'm going back and i find you know that young people around the world it's a very very concerned uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's true in the united states too but again maybe a little less so here than in many countries mm -hmm. uh, chinese young people are very concerned they've experienced these terrible conditions uh so I, that is our hope uh, that's my hope that, that, that the future generations will, will get this and somehow uh, correct the mistakes that my generation uh, made. Yeah. Uh, and, and often we didn't know we were making those mistakes. We made tremendous contributions to medicine and science and technology. There's no question. And, and the arts. But we've gone past the limits. And mm -hmm. we've created this death economy. And, and so it's up to this, these next generations that are coming along to, to fix that. It'll and be interesting. Each generation kind of seems to have this this uh i want to say glory hole i don't know why but i'm going to go with glory hole this this sort of this sort of uh you know enlightenment and yeah we're going to change things like the boomers had you know we're going to change things love and peace and then as soon as they start having families they kick right into gears the it was the ibm life and you know uh they, they change uh i think i don't, I don't know if us gen xers ever had any sort of thing we were just trying to fucking survive as latchkey kids in the streets, uh, you know, until the uh, street lights came on, you know, we were on our own. Uh, the millennials definitely had seemed to have some sort of mandate or self mandate or whatever you want to call it to improving the world more. And I don't know, they just spent all the time on Instagram. Now this new generation, like you say, does seem to have its own mandate. But uh, does TikTok play into into uh, the, some of the scheme of your book? Do you talk about it at all, or, or maybe your thoughts on the whole TikTok debate? Well, TikTok, <laughs> I'm on TikTok sometimes. I, there you I, go. I, it's kind of fun. Uh, I recently I have conversations with my cat sometimes on TikTok, which is kind of fun. Oh, I should tune in for that. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, TikTok and all the social net media is 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 is, is the future. It's the present, mm -hmm. and it's going to get more and more that way. And if we can complain about it and so on and so forth, but it's there. And the question is, how do we use it appropriately? You know, when the Gutenberg press was invented back whenever that was, uh, it, it, it said, you know, that a lot of people pronounced that it would be the end of the world because up until then, the church had controlled everything that got printed, everything that got distributed was basically hand copied by 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 monks. <laughs> and so the church, you know, controlled all this. 
religious data and they said well you know if everybody can can print their own stuff it, that's the end you know the devil yeah. take over so the devil did take over i think <laughs> yeah and television again when i was a kid it's like wait a minute this is going to destroy us and maybe it has <laughs> but here we go again uh, but so i you know i think that the, but but it's what it is yeah. and and i do believe that you know you talk about each generation having hope and we had a lot of changes when you think about it when i was in college nobody would have ever considered there to be such a thing as same-sex marriage mm -hmm. forget about the whole trans transgender issue and and all the issues around gender and 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 sexuality and and, and and you know there were no women or ceos back in those days and i, I remember when i went to business school i don't remember how many were in my class but there were a lot there were several hundred uh, in my class and there were only three women yeah uh, so th i mean things have changed a lot and, and look at how we've changed that you know it wasn't very long ago that we said solar and wind can never compete economically with fossil fuels well that's no longer true mm -hmm. and so there have been huge changes that have occurred. We sometimes forget that. Yeah. And, and some of them have been disappointing and some of them have caused problems, but uh, we're able to, you know, that, that very technology that you're talking about it is enabling us to do this right now. Of course, I don't have to fly to wherever you are in order to, to, to be on your show now, which wasn't true 10 years ago. I would have had to fly there to, to be on that show or you would have had to send a camera yeah. over here, you know, it's amazing. It's a, it, the, the changes that have occurred are phenomenal. The question is, how are we going to use them? And we need to change our perception about what it means to be to be successful human beings, being human on this planet, and mm -hmm. stop working towards short-term materialistic gains, gains, and focus on on long-term benefits for all life. There you go. That's always a good idea. I, I find that uh, focusing on long term for life is probably self-serving enough to <laughs> want to chase after because I kind of like to be here tomorrow and get a burger. Um, but it, lastly, as we go out, because we want to tease you know, why people should buy your book and, and get them to order it, uh, it. What do you hope people walk away from in this new updated version? Well, one of the, well, the, the, all the things we've been discussing, we must transform the death economy to a life economy. We simply must make that happen. And the role that each of us can play. And so at the end of the book, there's a whole process of what each individual, really five questions that, that goes into some detail uh, that we can each ask ourselves. So how do we participate? And, you know, like the first question is, what is it I most want to do for the, for the rest of my life? What will give me the greatest satisfaction? I'd say I want to write. I love to write. Mm -hmm. And and my I have a friend who's a carpenter who'd say, I want to work with my hands in wood. Mm -hmm. The second question is, how do I do that in a way that's going to help transform the death economy to a life economy? Mm -hmm. And I would answer by saying, I'm going to write about these things. I want to inspire people through my writing. And my carpenter friend will say, I, well, I'm only going to use sustainable materials. And I'm going to tell all my clients that they that when they use sustainable materials, it's it's not an added cost. It's an investment in the future for them and their children. Yeah. And then, and then the, the last three questions go about get, deal with what, what are your personal blockages that are keeping you from doing whatever you most want to do? And how do you take actions to change those? And it goes mm -hmm. into some detail around that. But I think the important thing, Chris, is, is it doesn't matter whether you're a podcast host or like you or a writer like me or a plumber or, or a teacher or a dentist or, a, you know, whatever you are, a parent, a student, whatever you are. Uh, you can ask yourself these five questions and participate in doing what you most want to do for the rest of your life in a way that will help contribute to a world that all of our children and grandchildren will want to inherit. There you go. Well, that's definitely a lofty goal, and and it's it's important for the future of uh, whether you talk about the U.S. empire or whether you talk about the uh, future of our children and grandchildren, as you mentioned. So there yeah. you go. I think, you know, the, the subtitle here is How to Stop the global takeover mm -hmm. is uh and, and that's not china's global takeover that's the global takeover of this death economy mm -hmm. and uh i think that's just um that is the to me that's that's the most important part of the book it's not necessarily the most fun part the fun part i think is talking about some of the things economic hitmen and jackals did some of mm -hmm. the stories yeah. You know, like to i like to write it like it was a novel even though it's not a novel it's a and it's non-fiction but full of stories and this is, these are lofty goals. Should the people of America start looking at some of these pan-globus billionaires 
and and trying to support or vote or move political powers in such a way that they're supportive of him. And the Koch brothers are notorious for being, you know, people that, uh, in my understanding, uh, are, are big pollutants. Uh, do they need? Do, do you know we need to look at how we vote as well? Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, how, how do we, we vote for people in politics and for corporations? that are moving us toward a life economy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think one of the sad things about the billionaires and uh, big corporations is a lot of them don't pay taxes or they pay very few taxes and they benefit from all the services they get. They benefit from our fire departments, our police departments, our schools, our airports, our highways, all of these things they benefit from and they don't pay their fair share. Uh, and and so I, I think that's uh, you know the the idea of, of not ta- uh, the idea of, t- of taxing making sure that the rich and the big corporations pay their fair share of taxes is extremely important. Yeah, there you go. Vote there in the marketplace go. and vote in the voting polls. There you go. I mean, we should. I think we should have. Uh, I think this has been a joke from a comedian, so I don't want to say I, it's mine. But I think someone said once that politicians. You know how NASCAR, they, they're they covered in all the badges of all the companies that sponsor them? We should have that the same thing with politicians. I love that idea. Would that I like be, that idea. Would yeah. that be funny as hell? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I'm not voting for that guy because... Uh, because uh, Skittles is sponsoring. I don't know why you'd be not want to vote for some of Skittles. I mean, come on. It's a great candy. I don't know. but <laughs> I'm probably going to sue now by Skittles. Anyway, guys, uh, it's been wonderful to have you on, uh, John. And it's an, a very insightful uh, conversation we've had and hopefully given some people some hopes for the future and, and some ideas on what to change. Well, I appreciate you, Chris, and all that you do. And thank you for having me on the show. It's been a great pleasure. And keep up your great work, you know, getting the message out, informing the public and inspiring and getting people to ask questions and question everything and you know that's part of democracy democracy yeah. democracies require that we be critical of, of what we're doing <laughs> yeah. and, and, and in, order, in order that we can change it yeah we had two choices we either had uh, kim kardashian content the kardashians content or housewives of whatever this week or uh, smart uh, brilliant authors like yourself on and we chose that so <laughs> man, man I, sh- I should have i should have dressed differently for the show i think <laughs> probably i don't know i should too anyway uh, uh john uh as we go give us your dot org so people can find you on the interwebs please johnperkins.org and please put your email in the little box that says subscribe to my newsletter because then you'll know where I'm going to be appearing. You'll learn about the trips I take people on to South and to shamans and so forth. Mm. And uh, I travel around a lot and speak at different places. So I hope I'll meet some of your, your audience. But if they put their email in the little box, I, it, the newsletter comes out just only about once a month. It's, you know, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's short and fun. And, uh, and, and we'll let you know what, what I'm up to and where I'm going to be. So I'd love to meet some of your audience. There you go. Uh, order it up, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, remember, say how the value of bookstores. Sometimes they're a bit overgrown. You might need a tetanus shot if you step on the nail. Uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the third edition out, February 28th, 2023 by John Perkins. Thanks for uh, coming on the show, uh, John. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com for Chess Chris Foss, youtube.com for Chess Chris Foss, and... Uh, uh, let's see, what is there? LinkedIn as well. Somebody says, I adore John Perkins. He showed us the tricks of the economic trade we never knew about. Thank you, JP. So thank you, Cheyenne, for offering that up. There you go. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.